Good evening, guys. How's everyone doing out there? Evolutionary.org podcast coming your way. Steve Smee along with Rick. How's it going, man? Hey, what's up, Steve? What's up, guys? All right, guys, we have some awesome topic. Let's, let's just jump right into it. The first one, this is a topic that a lot of guys have been asking about lately. I'm not really sure why. It might be like something on social media going around, but it, now everybody wants to use insulin. We're seeing all kinds of guys posting threads and making logs about insulin like it's some magic um, compound or something. So, you know, let's first talk about what insulin is. And insulin is a hormone. And yes, it is a very anabolic hormone in our body. And the nice thing about it is every time you eat food, your insulin levels spike unless you are a type one diabetic and your pancreas is not functioning. Or if you're a type two diabetic and your pancreas is not functioning properly, then that would prevent your body from spitting out insulin, your pancreas from spitting out insulin and lowering your blood sugar after a meal. So really the use of exogenous insulin is something that has been talked about a lot in bodybuilding and in the fitness world. And that word anabolic really attracts guys to it because they think that if they take insulin, that it's somehow this magic being that's going to magically um, give them big muscles and stuff because they hear that word anabolic. But in essence, guys, I'm the more I've researched insulin and yes, I've used insulin a couple times myself to experiment with it. The more I've, I'm convinced I'm very, very anti insulin use. It does way more harm than good. Um, and let me just say that I'll let Rick in to give his thoughts. Um, the problem is, is that it's so easy to access now. And Rick, you know, tell us a little bit how easy it is to access where people can get it. And what are your thoughts on it? And I'll kind of close up with, with uh, more, my, uh, some more opinions on it. But go ahead. Well, insulin is not criminalized the way steroids are. So it's a lot easier to get because people are less uh, worried about getting in trouble. So they'll, they'll traffic it. And it's pretty easy to get. The reason I don't really mess with insulin myself or don't advise people on insulin couple of reasons. One of them is, you know, you can hurt yourself uh, if you don't take one shot correctly. I have a buddy of mine that um, bought some stuff from a guy at a gym and he had some little bit of gear and, and insulin. And um, he took his shot. He thought he had a little bit more time than he did. He jumped in the shower and he got lightheaded and slipped in the shower and, you know, it was a big thing in his house. Um, so, you can get lightheaded from it. Um, can you really like die, die from one shot? Eh, you have to take a lot, but still it's, it's harder to deal with than regular juice. And also just the quality of how it makes you look. I guess, I think if you make some comparisons to the bodybuilders before insulin use became so prevalent and now you see some real different physiques, you know, the, the steroids, have always kind of been there, but it was insulin that kind of puffed everybody up and, and blurred the lines, you know? So I think, I think the, the effects on the VC, if you're top level, top level guy, you have a coach, sure, why not go for it? You know, top level guy, you got a coach, everybody else is using insulin, I guess, right? But just a regular Joe, stay the fuck away from it. You should first step with, Good habits, both diet and training. Then what you can get naturally over the counter uh, without breaking the, the laws. And then if you need something stronger than that, you should look. Then you start looking into, into juice, into the sauce. But to me, insulin is way down the line. It's if you're at that level. That's just my, my opinion on it. I don't, you know, mess with it and I don't advise it. I don't think anybody needs it really to get, uh, to get big and to look good. I don't think anybody needs it. Well, the issue is, Rick, is that every time you eat food, your insulin levels spike in your body. And because we live in a society where, you know, we've been brainwashed into waking up, got to throw food at ourselves all day, every two hours. Remember, you know, what Rich Piana used to say, got to eat 10 meals a day. And a lot of people believe that. I'd say most people, if you interview them, actually believe in the whole wake up, throw food at your body, eat every two hours. You got to have tons of protein. You got to have tons of, you got to have sugar before you work out. You got to have sugar after your workout. 
So you're spiking insulin all fucking day. So to add more insulin makes absolutely no sense. At the end of the day, guys, what's going to happen when you use insulin is you're just going to get fat. That's what's going to happen. It's the same thing that happens with people who become insulin resistant. Their blood glucose goes to 100, 110, 120, 130, on and on and on, 200, 250. They become type 2 diabetics. They basically, it's an, it's, they become obese. So that's what's going to happen, guys. We already have too much insulin in, in our bodies. The way we eat, the amount of food we eat, the uh, times of the day we eat, it's just spike, guys, as it is. The only way to get your insulin levels down is to not eat. So you go long periods of time without eating. That's why I'm a proponent of intermittent fasting and prolonged fasting to get your insulin levels low. We want our insulin levels to be low. We don't want them to be high. And that's, that's what's going to make you fit. That's what's going to make you lean. So stay the fuck away from insulin. There's absolutely no reason to use it. Just because these top level pro bodybuilders, they use insulin, they use HGH, they use tons of steroids, they use tons of drugs, they use all kinds of shit. They have top 0.01% genetics, completely different situation than a normal gym rat. There's, there's absolutely no reason for you to use insulin and it's extremely counterproductive, guys. And you can read more of my posts on, on insulin on the forums. I'm a huge anti-insulin person. Anytime someone says to use insulin, they're absolutely wrong. They're absolutely wrong. And I will debate anybody on this, on this subject. There's absolutely no reason for anybody to be using insulin. It is horrible. It's, it's horrible, guys. We have too much insulin already. Absolutely. It's like saying you need sugar. You need to add refined sugar. You need to add candy bars to your diet. We already have too much sugar in our diet as it is. There's no reason why you need to add more. It makes absolutely no sense. All right, guys, uh, next topic is a good one. This person is saying he's on trend and he's saying he wants to fuck everything that moves. He wants to know why is this? And he wants to know, this is the second part of the question, how the, do I stop myself from cheating on my significant other? So, you know, let's talk about the first one. I want to get Rick in on this as well because he's, he's studied this as well. But my, um, based on my, you know, research years of doing this trend definitely fucks with your mind more than any other steroid of, of the main steroids, at least. And one of the reasons I believe that it does is its effects on prolactin and effects on dopamine, which are inverted, um, uh, ish, uh, inverted type of uh, properties in the body. So your dopamine levels kind of are kind of your, um, uh, satiated uh, neurotransmitter in your brain. So your dopamine level levels when it comes on trend are going to go crazy. So you're going to feel the need to, you know, go, you know, have sex with different women. You're going to have to feel a need to go be more aggressive, maybe go gamble, maybe go, um, you know, do things that you wouldn't normally do. From a sexual standpoint, you'll find yourself maybe doing things sexually that you may not normally want to do, like say swinging or something, taking your girlfriend or wife to a swinger party or something. You would never do that off a of trend, but you do it on trend because that dopamine that, that kind of fucks with your brain, you know, it's got that neurotransmitter effect. So that's why you feel the urge to, to want to cheat on your significant other. Also the androgenic effects of trembolone very androgenic, five times as, as androgenic as testosterone on paper. And I believe that. And that those androgens really fuck with, with you as well. It gives you that alpha feeling of, of wanting to just go and fuck everything. So, I mean, Rick, do you, do you, do you agree with that? What's your thoughts on, on this? And, and answer this guy's second part of the question about um, how can he stop himself from cheating on a significant other? Yeah. I mean, uh, Every tissue in your body has receptors for both androgens and, you know, estrogen hormones. So they affect your body in all types of ways, from the bones to your organs, to your skin, to your, to your brain. You know, your brain has a lot of receptors for both androgens and estrogens. So this is why hormonal levels affect you so much. Yeah, it'll make you a, a ravenous... Um, I don't know what to call it. It'll make you run into something. And yeah, it'll make you want to stray. It'll make you want to just hump everything that moves. And you have to just practice self-control, discipline, and understand it. You have to know 
what it is. You have to know that that's just, it's just a tremble on talking. You just have to kind of remind yourself as a tremble on talking and, and realize that, you know, you will come down off of this feeling. But man, you know, just really giving it all in, in the gym, taking every set to failure, you know, doing some, some hard cardio, you know, that's enough to, to take the edge of some of that energy. So if you can, uh, if you have a gym that has a nice hot area, you know, some of that, man, it's, it's, it's a good way to, to rechannel that energy and not be so, uh, so horny. But if you're sitting there on trend and you're like allowing yourself to watch, you know, porn videos or, or continuously thinking about sex, obviously it'll build up on its own. It'll, it'll build onto itself. You know, if you're sitting there and you start really thinking about sex and you don't control your, your thoughts, and then you start to get a chubby and it starts to, to press against your garments, it, it, things will just spiral from there. So just don't keep your mind on sex. To rechannel that energy. When you do feel sexual, make sure that it's with your partner, with your mate, that, you, that you're committed to, that it's got your back, that you're with all the time. And that's it. I mean, that's, that's all I can give you guys. Just rechannel that energy. When they say, oh, cold shower, hot shower, yeah, do that. Rechannel that energy. Work harder in the gym, harder uh, cardio, and um, that's it. Got anything else, Steve? <laughs> yeah, I really think um, if you're in a relationship, training is a bad idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna just straight to the point on that. So I would basically say, when you're single, go for the trend. But if you're in a relationship, you might want to choose something else. Um, and I can tell you from, from, you know, personal experience, it really does, it does make it very, very difficult to, to not want to cheat. So you have to be smart about it. And I, it, it Trent has a, has the reputation to, for being the relationship killer. That's, that's, that's not just bro science. It's, it's, it really is true. So I strongly recommend you know, if you're married or something, trend might not be a good choice for you. So just food for thought on that. And I'm just, just a fair warning on that. So don't, don't, <laughs> don't come back and say, Oh my gosh, you should have warned me because we're, we're warning you. All right, guys. So then, uh, the next one kind of goes hand in hand with it. Unite unique life stressors and how to keep them at bay. And um, you know what, like Rick and I, you know, talk off air a lot about, things you know that go on in our lives and rick and i have had tough lives i mean um there's a lot of people who've had way tougher lives than us but you know um we've done we've had to deal with a lot of bullshit and it's kind of it kind of you know makes you angry that a lot of shit happens in our life a lot of stresses that we don't deserve you know life isn't fair so how do you kind of you know kind of keep that negativity and keep that stress um, maintain, Rick. Um, I'll let you in on this first. What What are some tips that you've learned over the years to kind of keep yourself sane on that? Well, there's a lot of things. Um, at the core of it, selfish. You gotta You gotta try to find that emotional maturity. You know, keeping control over your emotions and your thoughts in a good, healthy way. It's probably one of the one of the most important life skills I think anybody can learn. Just keeping control over your emotions, keeping control over your thoughts can help you be more disciplined, um, can help you have more willpower. And unique life stressors, that goes along with those things. You just, you have to find that way to keep more control over your thoughts, over your mind. You know, um, you're not supposed to, I can't remember where I heard this, this was a while ago, but such a good idea. I just kept my mind. It's not supposed to think about something twice unless you're like thinking about it. So if you have uh, thoughts that just kind of make you feel bad, but don't lead to any resolution to any solution, then maybe keep them out of your mind. If you have to think about something unpleasant to unravel it and make sense out of it in your mind, I guess that's, that's fair enough. If you have a Well, before, before we get to that point, Rick, why do you think that like 
bad shit happens to, to good people. Like, and, and like good people, we do everything right. We work hard. We, we hold up on our own bargain and we end up getting fucked like in different things. Like it could be anything like in life, like it could be, you know, a girl cheating on you to, to something happen at work to the auto mechanic fucking you over um, on your car, fucking your car up. What, why do you think from a psychological standpoint, um, those things tend to happen? And then you have these assholes, you know, um, who just get away with everything. Any thoughts? I on think that? that, I think, I think when you look around and you see those things, I think that's more of a confirmation bias type of situation. They're really at its core. There really are no good or bad events. They're just events. Good or bad is what you make out of it. You know, you can win the lottery and it could ruin your entire life or you can get cancer and come out of it a better person on the other end. There really aren't any, any good or bad happenings. It's just what you make out of it. You could lose a job that you thought was the perfect job. And then you could just get depressed, drink, sit on your ass, or you can go and get out there and look and really look and really try and bring all that experience and, and everything you got in you to, to the next opportunity and find something even better. And then when you're at the other, other job, you'll say, wow, looking back on it, losing that job is the f- best thing that happened to me. So you, it's, there really are no good or bad. I think it's just what you make out of it because I've seen it both, man. I've seen people that were either went, won the lotto, got born into money, you know, uh, landed the woman they thought they really wanted, uh, you know, just think they have something happen to them and in some way it turns into something negative. And I've seen it on the other end. People that lose family members, people that, that lose friends, they make changes, deep changes within themselves. Maybe they, they were dabbling in drugs and then they had somebody close die from drugs and they went through a rough time and now they're out and they're not using drugs anymore and they become industrious. So I, I just, things happen, good and bad to all kinds of people. And having money or receiving money, it's no sign of, of real, real happiness. I guess some people that are real happy with themselves and, and are optimistic and get out there and work and, got, and got, has a, have a lot of energy, a lot of optimism, they'll tend to be more successful and, and you, know, uh, you, know, smack some, you know, make some bread. And then you know, you'll have people that are quite a bit negative and, and maybe have a more of a, of, a, of a victim mentality. They think they're just a, a leaf in the wind. And then those people will tend, it'll tend to seem like bad things happen to them. And it's just, I think confirmation bias. And also when you're, I think the successful people tend to not talk or complain about the problems in a, in a, like I need to let steam out matter. I think they need to be, they, they actually try to be more proactively trying to fix things. So you never sound like they're complaining or telling you about a problem. They're telling you about an opportunity to challenge the presented itself where you get somebody who's maybe a bit more pessimistic and they'll just tell you about this, this huge thing that just came and, and ruined their existence. And it's all in the perception, man, is what I think. Once you get into that rabbit hole, it's kind of like the economy. You, you ever notice like the economy, the way economy works? The economy will slow down and then we'll kind of go into a recession. We'll dip into recession and the, the domino effect will keep going, keep going. Then it'll hit rock bottom when everybody's freaking out. Everyone's you know, short selling their house, everyone's house is going to foreclosure, everyone's losing their job, companies are laying off workers. That's when you go in there and you start, you know, buying real estate and you buy stocks and stuff. It's the bottom, you know, and then things rebound. It's kind of like a ricochet effect. So it's kind of the same thing. You don't want to get into that domino effect of negativity. Do you remember the podcast we did with the caller where the guy had the accident and he was just getting back into training after having had the accident? And yeah. the guy, the guy was, um, it was some kind of, you know, legal situation around his crash that he had to deal with now. And he had all this, uh, all these injuries and they would have prescribed them. I think they tried to prescribe him some opiates. And at that point with his accident, right? One or two things could have happened. He could have re- taken the opiate prescriptions, abused them probably. He already had some issues. It seems like, because he said it himself, he had some legal things to deal with after the crash, but, um, and he could have just made things a lot worse or 
he recovered without without addictive drugs. He said he it wasn't that bad. You know, your body does adjust to everything, even pain. And he said he would, he just, he wrote it out. And now he wanted to get back into fitness. He was back in the gym. He was back into, into a, a healthier lifestyle, staying drug free. You know, that crash could have turned his life either way. And, you know, we had a caller who, it's a good example of that. He could have went either way with it. The crash could have woke him up like, hey, idiot, you're not supposed to be doing this. You're crashing your, your property, smashing into other people's shit. What are you doing? Or it could have been like, oh, now my car is gone and I have these opiates. Now I really have nothing to live for and I'm all messed up. You know, it, it, it's that. It's just what, what you make of it, really. Yeah, that's it's it really is true. So at the end of the day, guys, um, you know, I, I think on a day to day basis, let's say you had a really tough day at work. You can go one or two ways. Like Rick was saying, you can. And I have friends, you know, that I've worked with over the years and what they'll do, they have a stressful day. They'll just fucking get hard liquor and just get drunk. And you see that all the time. Go to I see across the street from my gym, a, a bar. It's like a sports bar. And every day it's. People roll in and get out of their car. They go in there and they drink. That's they hate their job and they're miserable and they drown their sorrows in alcohol. Or you can do what I do and go to the gym and get out your stress that way. And a lot of people you see at the gym who are the regulars, the hardcore guys, like 99% of you guys listening, we all use you know that negative stress. We turn that into a positive by getting more fit, getting more healthy on a day-to-day basis. So there's always, you know, um, at the end of the day, just, just remember, as long as you have a wardrobe, you're already richer than most of the world. Most people in the world, um, a billion people in the world live on a dollar a day. So, I mean, trust me, as bad as you think you have it, you don't. And, um, I highly recommend every day when you wake up, just think of five things that you're grateful for. Just count them out. Five thing could be anything. It could be you're grateful for your dog. You could, you're grateful for having a roof over your head. You're grateful they have a fridge full of food. Any anything it could be a little thing. Could be a big thing. And if you start doing that, good things will happen to you. But if you wake up and you think like, "Fuck, I have to go to work. I hate my life. I hate this girl that's laying next to me or this guy laying next to me," then your life will never improve. So it's all about guys. It's a magnet. You got to attract. So laws of attraction, attracting positive things to happen in your life. All right, guys. And, and then yeah, like, and anybody that wants to that wants to hear the podcast, they mentioned the guy with the with the broken neck, the injury. It's podcast 265. He's a caller. He called in after a pretty nasty injury. Uh the reasons he was uh he was in a car crash where, you know, not not good. It was some stuff around it. And he um he basically uh you know, took it and made, made something good out of it. So it's a, it's a good podcast to listen to if you guys want, want to go back. All right. So the next one is about hair loss. Um, why does it happen first off and how to prevent it? So let's talk about natural remedies for hair loss, also drugs and why you, you should or should not mess with them. So first let's go over why it happens and I'll let Rick come in because Rick has some uh, natural solutions to help you guys out. So guys, when you, you know, as we get older, the longer, you know, your, your body's uh, producing testosterone, you're, you use steroids, anabolic steroids, which, which are androgens, which metabolize into dihydrotestosterone, which is DHT. And then your body naturally produces testosterone when you're off steroids, which also metabolize into dihydrotestosterone, DHT. Now, DHT is not a bad thing. It's not our enemy, but too much of it, especially over time, and if you're genetically prone, will have effects on both your prostate and your head hair follicles. Basically, that DHT will fry your head hair follicles, and then your hair, your, your hair will, will fall out. That's why as people get older, they start losing their hair. And then as people abuse steroids, they start losing their hair. Like all these guys on social media who claim, you know, Hey, I'm natural. Or they claim, you know, they don't use steroids or they claim they're, they just use a little steroids and they're all bald. Well, they got bald from abusing steroids. That's kind of sped things up. But of course you can go bald from not using steroids as well. So do steroids increase hair loss? Absolutely. It will affect it. My, I myself, 
when I use a uh, trend plus winstrel together, I could grab my hair. Okay. And I have a full head of hair. I could grab my hair and then look down and I have a bunch of hair on my hand. It was that bad. So certain steroids are worse for hair trend, winstrel, um, a lot of the DHT derivative steroids that are out there, they're really bad for hair. Uh, I'd say the more mild steroids like DECA, maybe a, a little bit of Primo, a little bit of EQ, those will kind of be gentle on the hair. So, you know, what do we do? What are some natural remedies? I'm going to let Rick talk about the natural remedies. And I'm going to, and then after I'm going to tell you why you should be very careful um, if your doctor suggests some of these uh, DHT blocking drugs. I went bald around 25 not really bald my uh, my crown got really really shiny and this is you know years before i started my own company and i wasn't uh, as versed on the chemicals as i am today so when it's when my when i got that little shine up there at the crown i just cut it all down and rocked the balding you know my head's nice and round i shaped and i was kind of happy to just rock a little bit of stubble all around and not have to deal with, you know, dealing with my hair and, and whatnot. Back then, it was a lot harder to get Nizoral and Minoxidil. Today, it's real easy to get Nizoral and Minoxidil. But if you're worried about your hair, if you haven't given up on the fight, uh, Nizoral uh, is a good shampoo. Use it. I think 1% you get over the counter. Uh, I would definitely use it along with N2 shampoo. That's my product from N2BM. And that one has caffeine in it with emo oil. I'll tell you guys about that in a minute. It's uh, pretty unique. And also uh, treatment when you're not, when you're not in the shower uh, for leave in is minoxidil. These are all things that'll help the cause of basically just blocking the androgens out of the hair follicles, which when the androgens attach to the androgen receptors in the cells on the hair follicles, well, they, starve out the cell basically and the hair gets thinner thinner and it drops so um i you know using using a, a minoxidil nizoral here and there it's helped me maintain my stubble now i'm about to hit 40 next year and it's you know it's going away little by little i was just prone to it it's just in the genetics and that's what's just going to happen uh, i'm sure the steroids sped it up a little bit but the things that helped me the things that helped me keep a little bit of a, of a darker uh, stubble on my body there were basically those three items. Uh, Into shampoo came much later, obviously. I, that product we didn't release until uh, about uh, 2014. But um, Nizoral and, and Minoxidil, uh, before they, you know, you had to underground them a little bit. Uh, Minoxidil was, was prescription for a while. But now uh, you can pick it up at Costco. Nizoral shampoo, pretty easy to find too, I think, at most pharmacies in most states. And um, N2 shampoo. N2 shampoo's got the caffeine in it. Uh, there are some good studies on caffeine um, helping to keep androgens out of the hair follicles. So there's good, some good studies on it. And I would love to just say that my product is, is the only shampoo with caffeine in it out there. But there's, it's caught on ever since we released the product. It's caught on the other shampoos out there with caffeine. But they don't have the same ingredients we have. We use some transdermal technology in our product to make sure that you're getting that caffeine in there. Um, some of these other places are more mainstream and they're, you know, they, they, I guess they put it in more for mention, but now we use emu oil, a couple other things in there to make sure that it, that you get that caffeine uh, nice where you need it. So that's been a good product uh, that a lot of people really enjoy and, and report back having really good results with. So I would, those are the three things, man, just treat right at the scalp. And um, I guess Steve will have some suggestions on the drugs to just prevent the conversion to the stronger the hydro hormones, right? Yeah. So there are there are a couple drugs. The main the main one, finasteride, which you might know as Prosca or Propecia, and then Dutasteride. But finasteride is the one that you hear most on forums, most most popular one. And the way that the drug works is a five A reductase inhibitor. So it's an anti androgen, and it's going to decrease the production of DHT by you know about 70 80 percent in both your prostate gland and the scalp so doctors they'll they'll prescribe that for people who have a large prostate and then you'll see some doctors also kind of prescribe it for people who need help with their head hair now on the surface it might seem like wow this is a good idea but 
here's the problem with it. Number one, if you're using a DHT derivative steroid, like let's say you're using Winstrel, it's not going to help you with that because since it is a 5A reductase inhibitor, it's going to decrease the DHT production. It's going to um, help with that, prevent that metabolization. So the problem is Winstrel is a, is a straight DHT derivative. So it's, you're getting it. It's going to kind of pass through that. So it's not going to help you with that. And then the second problem is why would you want to crush your DHT levels in your body? DHT is our sex hormone. DHT has a lot of properties. Um, will it affect your libido, your sex drive, your ability to get an erection? Absolutely. And we see that there's something called finasteride syndrome. You guys can Google it. There's thousands of stories of horror stories from guys who use finasteride because their doctor put them on that for hair loss or for prostate. And they have problems even getting an erection years later. And it's a major, major problem. So remember, DHT is not our enemy, guys. So instead of doing that, instead of taking a drug to take a drug to take a drug to take a drug, you just have to be smart when you cycle steroids. Keep the cycles short, keep the cycles um, conservative. And if you're prone to hair loss, you're going to want to avoid the harsher steroids that fuck up your hair. Like the ones I mentioned, the trend, the Winstrel, the DHT derivative compounds, the more um, you know, harsher steroids and stick to the more mild ones. And that's, that's the best option. I, I use N2 shampoo. Rick mentioned that one. That's, that's been a lifesaver for me because these shampoos that they sell in the store did absolutely nothing for me. Um, the N2 shampoo makes my hair stronger it also helps a lot with the itchiness um, that I get, you know, on my scalp, a very itchy scalp. So it's been, it's been a godsend for me um, using it. So I, I use that daily. So I highly recommend picking that up and giving that one a shot. Yeah. When, um, when I started to get that shine on the crown, I just, I just, that's it. I'm done. I wasn't going to brush my hair any weird way or, or have like a hairdo where I'm trying to, make it look like I don't have it just fuck it just rock the baldy and and that's it it's been part of my my persona now my baldy since you know my mid-20s you know that's just my my thing on it I I wasn't just going to be one of these guys holding on you know holding on to that little piece in the front and brushing it and you know trying to make it look full and all these weird things I didn't even really like doing my hair when I had a lot of it as a teenager I had just this thick, luscious, dark hair, just didn't like messing with it much. And it was like not the most entertaining part of my day. So as soon as I had the excuse to just go bold, I just did. And haven't looked back since, man, I was just fine with it. Yeah, I mean, some people, um, you know, some women like bald men, um, but some women absolutely do not. And it definitely does make you look older when you're bald. So but like I said, guys, I mean, everyone's different. Some people can really sport a bald look. Some people don't. So it really just boils down to, um, you know, your preference. So nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it at all. I got a nice round shape. Yeah, my, my, I think, I don't think my hair, I was ever, I don't think I ever really got the hang of how to really style my hair. And then when I went to a bald head, it just nice, nice round head. I'm, I'm fine, dude. All right, guys. So the next one, guys, uh, this is another one we get a lot. This guy wants to know why does his nuts shrink on cycle? And he wants to know what he can do to plump them back up. And then a follow up to that. And, you know, this one is about do women really give a shit about your ball size? So that's kind of one we're going to throw around. But let's first talk about why your nuts shrink on steroids. Now, you know, guys, this is kind of an individualized. Some people will not really notice their balls shrink very much. Some people will notice their nuts shrink to raisins. It just, just depends um, on the situation. And not, not everyone's going to be different. Every cycle is going to be different. Sometimes, you know, your nuts will shrink big time very, very quickly within a couple of weeks. Other times they may shrink by week 10, week 12. But anyway, the reason for that is because when you use any type of exogenous hormones, doesn't have to be just testosterone. It could be any steroid. What's going to happen is your pituitary glands realize, oh my gosh, we got a lot of hormones in our body. So your pituitary glands are like, shit, I got to just stop functioning because we got too much. So our bodies are smart. Our reproductive system is very, very smart. So it's going to shut off. It's going to stop producing hormones, the LH, FSH, which work 
to stimulate our lytic cells, which are, our, um, which are our basically our balls. And when that happens, your balls will start to shrink. And that's pretty much going to happen as soon as you start, you start using steroids. It's going to happen from day one. Then when you come off steroids, you run a PCT, your balls should hopefully, you know, come back. You know, they should, unless you completely fucked up your HPTA. But that's, that's a story for another day. So, you know, let's talk about what we can do to kind of prevent your balls from shrinking. So there are natural remedies, guys, that I, I, I strongly recommend. Again, go to natural route over the drug route. So I'm going to bring in Rick here. What are some of the best supplements, Rick, that will help keep your nuts plump on cycle? So just guys, um, just to start this off a little bit, um, just want to, you know, remind everybody out there that the way your testicles uh, decide whether to make testosterone or not, your brain controls everything really at the end of the day, right? But the way things are controlled in your body is through basically a big soup, a big mix of different signal carriers, hormones, different chemicals, basically just a lot of different things. And, and all the cells in the body react to the condensation of, of different hormones that affect them. So for example, LH, FSH, uh, the Leydig cells in your testicles are waiting to be stimulated by these two hormones. Now they might be in your blood system and travel all the way down to your tippy toe and then come all the way back until they finally run by those cells and stimulate them. But that's what the cell is responding to is the whole mixture, the whole chemistry in the blood system. This is why they can draw blood in your arm and know what's going on with the blood all over your body because the cells are responding to the condensation, how much of these hormones are in the blood right now. And that is what, what the cells are stimulated by. Uh, plants work in the same way. Plants also use different chemicals, phytochemicals inside of their functions to actually signal different things, growth rates and, and all types of different, uh, different situations. And a lot of those hormones inside of the plants are very much like the hormones inside of us, the same kind of structures. So throughout history, men have always found the different plants that have a chemistry that has an effect on us as well. Everything from poisoning us to making us uh, hallucinate to making us horny, you know, making us more virile. Men have at one point or, or another tried every plant out there. And this is why we have products like AC Generate work so well, because the plants in these products have already been identified by different cultures across the world to be very beneficial in making your, your testicles uh, plumper, making, giving you more fertility and giving you just um, more what you're looking for. So AC Generate itself, products been out now for about eight years. Uh, the formula has remained pretty well the same unchanged. It's been a hit since day one and people really enjoy the product. Yeah, guys. So, you know, what I like to do, guys, I like to use N2 Generate five caps a day, split dose. You can, you, you know, run two early, you run three later, or you can do like five before your workout. And when you're on cycle, it's going to really help keep your balls plump. And, and when you come off cycle, it's going to help plump them up a lot quicker. So if you can't afford to use it during cycle, definitely you want to use it during post cycle at the very least. So, and it's safe. It's completely natural. I really suggest going the national route guys. We have a lot of guys who use ACG, which is a, uh, which is pregnant. And basically that's derived. It's uh, derived from pregnant female urine. And I'm not kidding when I say that. And it's never been like, approved to be used for men for fertility or anything with men so guys will actually use it thinking they're getting recovered and it does plump your balls but the problem is in the process it is mimicking lh in your body so it is still suppressing your pituitary glands so that's not that's not what we want so that's that's not what we want at all plus it's going to increase estrogen so the natural route does not increase estrogen the natural route does not interfere with your pituitary glands does not interfere with your recovery so i always recommend the natural route guys um the supplements you know the fedosia the fenugreek the tribulus those those really do help yeah and, I, and most guys that i talk to they double up they use the chemicals uh the pharmaceutical stuff 
and then they come and use some of the natural stuff because you just feel that much better on it. And that's the experience I had. You know, that's the reason why these products even came about because I, I, just, I used to use Clomid, HCG, Novadex, and I just didn't feel great on it. It was uh, something I didn't look forward to. During the middle of my cycle, I would know, I'm like, shit, I got to start taking Clomid in four weeks. Man, I'm going to be moody. Man, I'm going to be feeling like shit. Like, I know it's, it, you know. I didn't even like, I learned the hard way that I couldn't PCT during like October, November months when it got darker earlier and the trees lost, lost their leaves. I mean, it was depression to that level. And it wasn't until, you know, I was in my, um, my late twenties, early thirties that I started messing with different herbs and different herb combinations to help along with my mood and my recovery and my libido. And that's how the product really started. It was just adding uh, these herbs to my own PCT and just trying to get a better feeling out of it. And I found that not only did I feel better, but I felt it, everything recovered quicker and, and things came along a lot faster. So really quick, you know, Rick, what's your opinion? Do you think really women really give a shit about the size of your nuts? I, um, she'd have to be into nuts to really be there trying to check them out. But of course, if she knows you're nuts and then one day you get, they're smaller, she's going to say something. She's going to be upset about it. I, I don't, I mean, I, that, that I don't know. But <laughs> could she notice it? Yeah. If she plays with them somewhat, yes, yeah, she'll notice them for sure. <laughs> I know I had a girl I was on cycle one time. She, she's like, I was talking to her. I was like, you know, I asked her that. And she's like, oh, I always just thought your your balls went back up in you. That's what she told me. I didn't really understand what the fuck she was talking about. But yeah, I explained to her, yeah, when you use hormones, that's what happens. So she was like, oh, that's that's interesting. She, I mean, she didn't really give a fuck. So I don't I don't know if it really matters. I I think it's more of a self conscious thing. Guys maybe feel like, oh, I gotta have big nuts. But like, look, if you do, <laughs> run these herbs. You know, you'll get big nuts really quick. Like within a week, you'll get you'll get bigger nuts. Yeah, I've, that's one thing I'm always afraid of is losing my my performance in, in the in the bed. It's one of the things I worry about the most. You know, because you you we live this lifestyle. We train, we diet to look good, and if you look good, and then when it comes time for action, you can't perform, you can't put out. That's embarrassing. And sometimes you only get you only get one chance to make a good impression. So, uh, you know, that's that's something I'm always. I've always been concerned with. And the reason I added the herbs to PCT was to make sure I wasn't going to be weak in that department either. So this kind of leads into our last topic, Rick. And that is the dangers of having a promiscuous lifestyle. And I'm talking about all the stuff you see um, nowadays. Um, you have all these apps like Tinder and I, I can't even name them. But I'll give you an example. A, a buddy of mine, uh, I, see, I haven't seen him in a few years. He was in town. We met up for lunch and uh, he's showing me his phone. And he's like, you know, Steve, check this out. He's like got six different dating apps, including Tinder and whatever, whatever all the apps are. And he's like going through them and he's showing me all the girls that he's talking to back and forth. And literally he travels a lot for his work. So he'll go into a town and he'll go on those apps and start messaging women while he's in town. And they'll message him back and he'll set up dates and stuff. So let's talk about like this promiscuous lifestyle that we see some, some people do. And is it wise? You know, what are the risk factors? So the, the two biggest risk factors I think is the STD risk, number one. And number two, knocking up a girl. And now you gotta, you're going to be stuck with child support for 18 years. That's right off the bat. And that happens all the time. Just turn on Maury. And you can see uh, those situations. Heck, if you turn on more, you'll see a woman bring on like five different men to test them because I mean, she doesn't even know who the father is. So, I mean, this, this is a huge, huge risk factor in, in doing that. Rick, what are your thoughts on this? And wh what are some of the things um, you think has been going on to cause this? There are several dangers to having a prom promiscuous lifestyle and not trying to settle down or, or giving yourself a chance to settle down with with a person for an extended period of time. There's definitely the health aspects. That's very important because not every disease can be prevented with a condom, stuff that can get right around it. So that's always a concern. As well as the heartache of it all. You know, any guy that's been a womanizer 
can tell you that he might have a hard time listening to sad songs. It's actually a song about it, I think. There is the heartache of it all because when you lie, when you cheat, it's hard to not get attached to people. And th there's that aspect of it. And then there's the aspect of like people that actually engage in like straight up prostitution where they, you know, go and pick up prostitutes and things like that. That's the health hazards in that situation are pretty, are pretty tough, I think, because I think most regular people out there, if they're having some kind of STD issue or some kind of outbreak or something, they're probably withhold from having sex with any, anybody, you know, but if somebody's, if that's their job, if they're a sex worker and they've got something going on, they're going to keep working. So definitely prostitution is not a good thing at all for anybody to engage in out there. What else you got, Steve? All right. what, 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 what do you think about uh, people who are trying to get into fitness or bodybuilding or trying to monetize you know, that lifestyle by doing like the webcam, the gay for pay, uh, stuff like that. Boston Lloyd, who we've had on the podcast, uh, uh, like three times, he actually started his own gay for pay site. I don't think it did well, but what do you think about that? Um, do you think that, <laughs> what's your advice for guys who, who do that or who want to get into that? Do you think that's a trajectory to disaster or do you think, Hey, you know, you got to make some money the way you can. The webcam, I actually don't think it's that bad at all because there's no other people involved there, right? So there's no chance of disease. It should be or supposed to be a drug-free environment, like these webcam things, I guess, right? I don't, I don't know. But there, I have less of an issue, I think, with webcam than I do with straight prostitution because the chances of disease are less and just the drug use with prostitution is... It's not, it's no, not bueno, it's no good. But webcam, I guess um, there is no physical contact. One person's making some money and the other person is fulfilling their, uh, their time, their fantasy, their loneliness a little bit maybe. I think the one that's worse off is the guy paying, looking at this cam, you know, making, making this a part of their life to, to ask people to do weird shit on a, you know, the other side of a camera. It's, uh, I guess it's a way to have some control because when you meet people in the real world that you try to get to be your made a partner, there is no control. But when you have porn, you could select your title, your gender, your, your style, your type. Now with this webcam, you have it kind of custom made for you. So you have total control over that, that point of gratification over the, over your, your sexual, over your orgasm, over your, your sexuality there, right? Where when you're out trying to get some nookie or trying to get your significant other to act a certain way, it could be tough. It could never, maybe never happen. So I guess I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't see that the webcam that bad unless people are on there hurting themselves and, or maybe people are having, uh, you know, dangerous uh, types of sex on webcam. That's, that's fucked up. But if it's just a dude in his bedroom with a dildo and another dude or girl with her dildo and somebody's paying the other on a webcam, I mean, I don't, you know, it's some it's gratific, sexual gratification without communicable diseases coming into the equation. That's why I don't see that's much of a problem with it. Here, here's, here's a, a thing though. I'll take it a different route. Like I was, I watched a show about this and they were doing, they were a couple and this guy like was really frustrated in his marriage because his wife, he'd come home from work and his wife would have the webcam all set up and she'd be like half naked. She'd be like, all right, we got to do our show. So he'd come home from work and he's basically has sex with his wife on the camera so she can monetize it. But there's like nothing. There's like no romance. Like literally every time they have sex, it has to be on camera so it can be monetized. So, I mean, that's what's the, the trajectory. I, over the long, do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's really kind of shitty, like, that he can't just have sex with his wife, like, in private and, and just make love to her, but he has to actually do it on camera all the time. It's kind of like a boxer, you know what I'm saying, who has to be on pay-per-view. He can't just go box on his own, you know? It's uh, just for recreation. It's always got to be for money. So I think, I think from that aspect, it's kind of um, 
it can be a bad thing, you know, just to get into that habit of always having to monetize everything you do sexually, you know, buddy, I, I fuck for free, man. If I was going to get paid to be watched, why not? <laughs> but I mean, no, but seriously, I mean, that's a very unique situation. I don't, I don't know how many people are really trying to make money on the webcam. That's a very unique situation. A very unique situation. You know, for the most part, I don't think any, any of us like anybody watching us, um, having uh, having sex we'd like to be private so that's a very unique situation what you mentioned there with a webcam uh, yeah. lady but yeah money co money comes into the equation bro like if you need some bread and you're somewhat marketable in some degree and people want to see you why the hell not dude you know what I, mean? I think i think long you have to consider long term where is this leading like long term like the trajectory do you really think you're going to be able to you know, go on a webcam and do your thing like forever. At some point you're going to have to transition to, to something else, but who knows? Maybe, you, you know, you know, what if your kids find it? What if your kids classmates find it? What if, you know, all, yeah. all these things, all this stuff is, is worth mentioning. They, yeah. You know, when it's, when it's, when it's like, when it's a person doing stuff with inanimate objects and then the other person is, is getting gratification and paying they're still sexual, but there is no dangers. There is no exchange of fluids. There's no, you know, nasty places, drugs involved, like I said. Um, and if one of the two people are on drugs, both don't need to be, you know, it's not, the other one's not touched by it. It's different. So that's just my opinion on that. I don't, I don't see a big deal with webcam. I think, look, it's still, still not great that you're, that this is part of your sexuality to watch somebody on webcam not ideal, but it's actually healthier than, than driving down the block at night looking for, looking for a date that's kind of fucked up. All right, guys. Listen, we had a great show, guys. Um, keep an eye on our next episode. We're going to be doing a testosterone part two. And then after that, we're going to be doing more steroid profiles and more Q&A. So keep the questions coming, guys. Really appreciate you guys listening. Have a good one. Have a good one, guys. Have a good one, Steve. All right. Guys, this is the required legal disclaimer. We are only sharing our experience from years of steroid use. We are not doctors, and none of what we say should be regarded as medical advice. Always check with your doctor before taking any drugs or starting any training program.